It is so awesome to have you all back together again. Yes. I'm going to read to us the scripture for today coming from Matthew 9, 35, and it concludes at chapter 10 and 8. So it sounds like I'm going to read two chapters today, but it's not quite that long. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out the laborers into the harvest. And then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles, first Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaan, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter into the town of Samaria, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out the demons. You receive without payment. Give without payment. Father Gregory Boyle, a priest in Los Angeles, California, began a, a ministry over 30 years ago called Homeboy Industries. It was a ministry for young men and I believe women who were a part of gang life in South LA. And in that 30 years, Father Boyle has buried 230 young men who have died as a part of gang-related life. One of those young men was a brother of a young boy by the name of Pedro. And it's Pedro's story that I want to share with you this morning. Father Boyle said that Pedro was not unusual in his circumstances. He was angry and he was resentful. And he internalized that anger and that resentment when he wasn't acting out. He internalized it and so it showed itself in addiction to crack. Over the time of their relationship, Father Boyle would approach Pedro about seeking rehab. And Pedro's answer was usually no. At some point when Father Boyle asked him about rehab, Pedro's answer was yes. Thirty days after he entered his treatment, his brother took his own life. Now, the story doesn't say this, so these are my words, this part. If I were Father Boyle, one of my concerns would be that Pedro would, would reactivate his drug life. For 30 days is not a long time to be a part of being sober and to get the chemical out of the system and to change any type of pattern of living and that this death of his brother would crush him in spirit even more. And so it was interesting that on the way to the funeral, as Father Boyle was taking Pedro, Pedro told Father Boyle that he'd had a dream that night before. And this was the dream. Father Boyle and Pedro were in a room. The room was absolutely dark. He said at some point, Father Boyle pulled a flashlight out of his pocket and turned it on and shined it 
around the room intentionally, slowly, until it came to rest with the light beam on a light switch on the wall. Pedro said there were no words spoken, but Pedro got up from the floor hesitantly and went to the light switch. And then with his own hand and his fingers, flipped it on. And he said to Father Boyle, not only in the dream, but in the car, as light filled that entire room, light is better than darkness. Father Boyle looks over at Pedro and he says, Pedro is just simply sobbing. All of those emotions, all of that time, everything going on around him, pouring out of him in that particular moment. And then he said the words that I think which really caught my attention for today. He said, I guess my brother couldn't find the switch. Yes, my brother couldn't find the switch. I love the, the language in the story because you think about it, the switch can mean change. The switch isn't just a device to turn on or to release electrons to, to uh, flow so that a light comes on. But, but in the broader understanding of switch, there lies an interesting pun that finding the switch is finding the transformation, discovering the transformation, and taking a step to accept that transformation. When Pedro, it's interesting, isn't it? We can illuminate life for people, but somebody has to flip the switch for themselves, yes? I mean, if I turn your switch on, so to speak, it's my action, not yours. And I thought about those words, I guess my brother couldn't find a switch. Father Boyle has a heart of compassion. Compassion that doesn't stop, doesn't give up, is, is relentless in the sense of being present. I don't mean relentless in terms of dominating, but relentless in the sense of being a, a constant presence. And for Pedro, Father Boyle was a flashlight that illuminated the darkness. It wasn't just in that one dream, it was the fact that Pedro interacted with him over a period of time and that Father Boyle was able in compassion to become an environment that helped Pedro see the switch to see the transformation and to have sufficient courage to flip the switch. It got me to thinking about divine compassion. What it means for you and me to be flashlights, to light up the dark. I think I think the most challenging, I, I, I almost would say, feeling condemned with words is to hear someone say about another human being that they couldn't find the switch. Now, it doesn't mean that there weren't those who tried or those who, who worked with them, but the sadness, even the grief, to know the switch that was there was unseen and unknown. To be a flashlight for others is to live compassion. And it's in essence that compassion I want to talk about today because quite frankly, some of you all know that you're flashlights, yes? <laughs> and, I, and you understand that you're a flashlight for compassion and for divine love, we, you get that, but but sometimes, my friends, as human beings, we are flashlights 
And what we're doing is, as we illuminate the room or the space around us, we're illuminating the weakness and the failures, sometimes of ourselves, because we're using a mirror to do that, but oftentimes we're using it to identify the weakness and the failures, the, the drawbacks that others have in their lives that they need to fix. And the purpose of the flashlight isn't so much to illuminate a switch as it is to illuminate what you need to fix. Because if, if I have a flashlight and I can illuminate what you need to fix, then I can say it's, it's your problem. I can say it's your responsibility. I can even say it's your fault. I do have a favorite saying that goes something like this. You've heard it before, I think. I didn't say it was your fault. I said I was going to blame you. But that's the game we play with the flashlight. The flashlight illuminates it, shows the weakness, shows the I mean, Father Boyle knew the shortcomings that Pedro struggled with in life, but his purpose with his flashlight was not to illuminate, to condemn. His purpose was to illuminate, to open up and to show a place of recreation and transformation and reconciliation. And not just simply with other human beings, but it was the reconciliation of Pedro to his own self, his authentic self. And so my friends, our flashlights can be used in two ways. They can use the energy to point out someone who has to take responsibility and do something different, which absolves us, yes, of action. Or we can use the flashlight as a means to help people discover the switch and the transformation. And it calls on us to do something. You know, that's the interesting thing in looking at biblical compassion, at divine compassion in the Gospels that was a constant. When it says Jesus had compassion for, and you can name the people or whoever it was in that particular moment, it was always followed by action. Never is there a time where Jesus has compassion. I have compassion for Mel over here, our lead singer. Mel, I have compassion for you. I feel bad for you. No wonders why. I feel bad for him. But if I do nothing to help heal or to help remove the barrier or to help Mel discover the switch, then compassion is just simply empty talk. In every instant in the Gospels, when Jesus has compassion, it is followed with action. It is followed with action. It is it interesting that Pedro is deep and Father, Father Boyle is in that darkened room with him. He's in the space with him. He's, he's giving himself to him. He's in that presence. Sometimes when our kids, as they grow up, we want them to discover a lesson. We want them to find a switch that helps them take that next step in life. And, and sometimes it takes longer for them to discover that than, than as a parent you like. Have any of you been there? Yes. And sometimes the temptation, the temptation is to flip it for them. But my friends, what compassion means is to walk alongside and to be present and to illuminate but we cannot control. We cannot control the decision of others. We can be an environment. We can be an encouragement. We can be a light. Because as soon as we try to control the outcome, we take the hand that was on the switch and we pull it off. Bishop Trimble in this last week invited uh, all of the clergy of the Indiana Conference to meet together in a Zoom meeting uh, to talk about our churches, United Methodist Churches in Indiana uh, response to racism. And he used a scripture as he, as he both did the invitation and, and on that day from Ephesians. It's Ephesians 1, 18. 
the gist of that scripture, my friends, is to say that the eyes of our heart find illumination in the hope, in the hope of our connection with Jesus Christ. Now that's the Rick Taylor version of Ephesians 1.18, so don't think I'm quoting directly. The eyes of our heart find illumination in the hope. You see, divine compassion has its roots in the agape, the best interest for others' love of God. It has its heart in a presence, an unchanging presence, that steadfast love. When the Old Testament talks about it, it's steadfast love of God from everlasting to everlasting. That is the place from which divine compassion is founded and rooted and flows from. And God's heart has always been for our heart, yes? And when I talk about our heart, I'm not just talking about the hearts that are in this room. I am talking about the hearts of the world. I sometimes, I sometimes believe that God must cry a lot and ache a lot because as a parent sometimes you lose tears when your kids choose a different switch. And yet, regardless of our choices, the divine compassion of God continues to come back to each one of us. Yes. In fact, I played in my mind a little bit with that idea, and I thought, what if Jesus had used his light like a flashlight, like sometimes we do as human beings, to point out weakness and flaws in order to condemn? And if that had been the case, there would have been no cross. There would have been no resurrection. There would have been no switch, no transformation of hearts. We just all would be condemned and out of luck. Divine compassion comes at us, my friends, from a different place. It's not compassion because they're blood brothers, they're family to us. It comes because the family is drawn in a broader understanding. It's God's family, not just my family. How do we embrace hearts? How do we carry a flashlight for people who are so different than we are. And for whom sometimes we think and believe are not on the same page or in the same world that we live in. I grew up in Indiana in small communities, graduating from Delta High School, north of Muncie, Indiana. And I grew up in a world that my first exposure to a biracial relationship was one night when I was in seminary my first year. I went to eat supper with a friend at Ponderosa, and this biracial couple came in. And I can remember the first thought that I had in my, had in my head, and it was instantaneous. And do you know what that thought was? It was one word. It was no. It was no. And it wasn't just no up here in my head. It was no. Now I was taught to respect all people. And I was taught that prejudice was a sin. And it wasn't until I lived in a world where there was a difference that I didn't understand that I had to confront the boundaries of my compassion. And I did not like, I did not like that, that feeling, I did not like that confrontation. And you know, I lived in the, the uh, region during the time of race riots and political unrest. Some of you in the room weren't born back in the 60s when that took place, some of you were. 
I remember after stretching a bit in my own life, my sister came to me and said, Rick, and I knew she was dating a black guy by the name of Frizzell, first name. And uh, she said, what do you think would be a good way to introduce Frizzell to the family? And I said, well, Thanksgiving is coming up. Mom and Dad have, have you know, always talked about being open. Okay. I said, so, you know, Thanksgiving would be a great time, right? So back he goes, and I think I set her up. Uh, I don't know if it was some sibling stuff going on underneath the surface or not. You know, we didn't really deal with that. But Becky went to mom and said, hey, what do you think about Frizzell coming to Thanksgiving dinner? And mom had four words, four simple words, over my dead body. Over my dead body. We just found the limits of my mom's in that moment. How do we know and, and embrace and become God's hope in such a way that we can embody divine compassion that illuminates darkness so that others might see the light switch? How do we live in such a way with the pressures that are upon us, the peer kinds of thoughts, the, the things that we brought from our past that have been instilled in us? I was set up to be prejudiced. Quite frankly, I think wherever you live, you just kind of grow up and that's your pattern, but that pattern contains limitations. And unless we confront those limitations ourselves and look for the switch, we just simply keep living them and protecting them on others. How did Jesus, with both friends and adversaries, live that kind of compassion? Only, only by the factor that it was divine and agape at the roots and at the base. What does it mean to have compassion? I really think one of the things that it means is to, that vulnerability is a part of our shining light for people. Especially when we're shining lights, not to identify somebody's weakness, but to shine light to say this is where the presence of God is and is leading. And there's a vulnerability to that. And part of that vulnerability, my friends, is the reality that we cannot dictate what someone else will answer. I want to dictate what someone else will answer, but I can't dictate it. I can force it and get acquiescence, but what I've done is actually ruin, ruin the compassion and the relationship at that moment. What does it mean for you to have compassion? What does it mean for you to be vulnerable to the movement of the Spirit? What do you have to release? What do you need to let go of in order to be able to fully embrace the hope that comes with the enlightenment of our eyes in Jesus Christ? What is it when you react to something that's happening around us today, whether it's related to COVID-19, or whether it's related to Black Lives Matter, what is it that you have to release so that you can listen and hear with different ears and different eyes? So that you, me, we, might be a part of healing. We might be a part of no more heartbreak. I looked at the news this morning and I cringed. Cringed, I heard. Another black man shot in the Wendy's parking lot in Atlanta during a, a stop because a guy was blocking traffic. He'd fallen asleep. They'd given him a field sobriety test and he, he 
tested such that he was inebriated. And everything was calm until one morning. In a matter of seconds, less than a minute, it all blew up and ended with another dead man, a fire officer, and a community just enraged. What does it mean to be vulnerable for you and me in these moments, to be a part of bringing healing? reconciliation and listening and to let the projection of the past be the projection of the past for those who are privileged it's not an easy time is it and yet at the same time I just remind you the divine compassion when Jesus heard for people it was always followed by action. It was always followed by helping, lifting, nurturing. Compassion, my friends, I believe, is the willingness to say I love you without any promise or guarantee of a positive response. Divine compassion, I believe, has risk to it. Risk that you'll be misunderstood. Risk that will be misunderstood. Risk that, that, quite frankly, somebody might limit us. And yet, if we're going to be reflective of the song that we heard this morning, one day there'll be a time when we don't need to worry about our children. One day there'll be a time when we don't need hospitals. Now I know the song has some reflection of the kingdom that is coming from an eternal perspective. But I also think there are way too many people using hospitals today. Because my friends, divine compassion, we struggle to do it, yes. We struggle to do it and to be divine compassion. So if there's something that our time has taught us about being a part of, it's how valuable all of you are to me and I hope to each other. And I don't mean value because we use you. By the way, my eyes are chuckling. It's not that. But that's our, really our lives, who we are, where we are, our well-being, our all intricately woven together. And as much as we are intricately woven together, our community beyond the walls of our church building is just as intricately woven together. When one part hurts, if the other doesn't recognize it, we will know it, yes? And if there is injustice, until there is harmony and balance, there's an itch. How many times have you guys walked down the road and hit a rock in your shoe? Walk down the road and get a rock or a pebble in your shoe. And the thing that amazes me is that it doesn't have to be very big to cause discomfort. And we know it. There are ways in which there are people in our community and in our world in our United States who are hurting today because the color of their skin dictates the response from others. Having, having a multiracial, now isn't this interesting, right? So Dave and Ohio, my answer to multiracial relationship is no. So having a son who is, son-in-law who is Indian, married to our daughter, I had to look at the boundaries of my compassion. I invite you today to think about and consider my compassion and the ways in which God is leading you, leading us, to be a part of illuminating the 
switch. Amen? And amen. Amen. amen.